Well, good afternoon. Hello and welcome to today, today's uh, lunch hour lecture. I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome Henrietta here, who's going to give her lecture. Um, uh, Henrietta is Professor of Culture, Philosophy and Design and Director of the Institute of uh, Sustainable Global Pros Prosperity. Uh, she was in this year's New Year's Honours List, so Professor Dame Henrietta Moore, I'm pleased to introduce her to you, who's going to talk on why glaciers don't like the smell of frying bacon. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, you might want to come a bit further down. You're all a bit far away, actually. But let's um, get right into what we're going to talk about, because we don't have much time. One of the things I'm very interested in, in the Institute for Global Prosperity, is how we relate to the world we live in and how we represent our relation to that world and the kind of knowledge it gives us of the world. So very soon we'll be nine billion on this planet and we are of course consuming it at an extraordinary rate. And this has come to be known as the Anthropocene, as the time when humans are changing the Earth systems irrevocably. And the question we have to ask ourselves is what does a great university like this have to say about the complex situation that that puts us in? Now, one of the questions is, are we listening to the world we live in? And in what way are we listening to it? Katie Patterson is a rather remarkable young artist who decided that perhaps there could be a different way of relating to the natural world. So in her exhibition, she simply had a telephone number on the wall. And you dialed the telephone, and what you got at the other end... <laughs> Iceland, not Ireland, Iceland. Now, glaciers are becoming fast a kind of endangered species in their own right um, as we go into climate change. And even with the good news of COP21 from Paris and the fact that we are committed to holding temperature rises to less than two degrees, we will have to do a great deal more if we want to save our glaciers. Now, one of the things is we might be listening to glaciers, but are they listening to us? And that was one of the things I wanted to start with today. There are, of course, people who have lived historically on glaciers, and they take the view that rather than being an immense white wilderness, a glacier is actually a social space, a space on which people interact, not only with each other, but with all aspects of that environment, including glaciers. Now, glaciers have a nasty habit, even without climate change, of suddenly surging, moving, sometimes several kilometers for no apparent reason at all. Scientists have studied this phenomenon, and they think it's about the deformation of structures and water underneath the ice. But if you lived on that glacier, you might be quite interested in why a suddenly immovable object starts to move. Now, the views that anthropologists have gained of these kinds of cultures is that glaciers themselves are sentient, that they have views, that they punish infractions, and they particularly dislike the smell of frying bacon. Now, the smell of frying bacon is an interesting one. We don't really know why glaciers don't like the smell of frying bacon, but probably what they don't like is people coming onto the glacier and, in a way, failing to respect the right kinds of social relations that have always been part of interacting with glaciers in these extraordinary environments. Now, one of the things we have to think about when we're thinking about um, inanimate objects like glaciers is... In what way are they sentient? Well, we are, of course, very used to thinking about all of living mammals as being sentient, particularly our dogs and our cats and our horses. We firmly believe that we know what Fido thinks, and Fido knows what we think. We interact with these animals over long periods of time, and we don't have any difficulty in imagining that they are somehow communicating with us. The question is, what might be the difference between animals and other forms that we encounter in the world we live in. Now, when we think about animals, we've always had a strange idea that the boundary between humans and animals is not very fixed. There have been transgressions of that boundary. Of course, werewolves, people, people who turn into animals, and Little Red Riding Hood. There's always a chance that Granny could kind of gobble you up. These stories have immense longevity in human history, and they exist in nearly all societies. 
And that's a kind of interesting idea, an idea that we, in the world that we inhabit, where science is dominant, find a little bit strange, or do we? I mean, we believe we can communicate with our dogs, but do we really believe that the boundaries between humans and animals might be much more porous or permeable than we imagine? Now, when we're thinking about how other people respond to their animals, they do, in many parts of the world, share a view that we share, and that is that animals and humans negotiate with each other. They learn. If you've ever ridden a horse or trained a dog, you know that's the case. Hunters all over the world, and in this case, hunters from the north of Canada, take the view that geese are clever that they're intelligent, that what geese do is they learn what the hunters do, and then they learn to avoid them. What do the hunters do? The hunters learn to call the geese using special voices, and they learn to move to different places at different times during the week so that the geese don't learn too quickly and learn to avoid them. There's a kind of ongoing relationality and negotiation, which is very important to how humans and animals interact. But when we're thinking about that negotiation, what kind of thinking do we imagine the animals are doing? What kind of learning? Does that learning that the animal does, does it require language? Now, of course, we've spent a long time in human science trying to do things like teach chimpanzees to talk. Uh, we firmly believe that dolphins can communicate with people, and it's probably only a matter of time before we teach dolphins to talk. There are lots of ideas of that sort round and about. And the question here is, does thought really require language, or to be a sentient being that a human has to take account of, do you need to have language? Now, what's one of the extraordinary things about the language barrier between humans and animals is that there are quite a number of human beings at the moment who are interested in whether or not they can be animals. Now, I don't know if you know uh, about Charles Foster. He's a British national, uh, naturalist. He studies the natural world. He spent much of his adult life trying to be a fox, a badger, a deer, and a swift. And so he crawls around um, woodlands in various parts of uh, uh, the UK, trying to understand what it would be actually like to smell and live and eat as an animal. Now, you might think that Mr. Foster is alone in this, but actually, he's not, surprisingly enough. We've got Thomas Thwaites. Now, Thomas Thwaites decided that he would go to Switzerland for three days and try to live as a goat. He developed all these prosthetics. Here he is climbing up the um, mountain in Switzerland, uh, chewing on some grass. The extraordinary thing about this is you might think, well, perhaps Mr. Foster and Mr. Thwaites are just on the edge of what we would think of as rational thought with regard to the boundaries between humans and animals. But I should point out to you that Mr. Thwaites' research was funded by the Wellcome Trust, just over the road from us, as a serious piece of scientific research. Now, when we're thinking about the boundaries between humans and the natural world, we sometimes forget how we are made up ourselves. Though we have actually inside our guts about 100 trillion bacteria, about 10 times as many bacteria as those genes we inherit from our parents. What that means is that we're about um, only, if you like, one-tenth human. That inside our bodies, we're not a single organism, we're an ecology of organisms. And inside us live a lot of other kinds of organisms which are not themselves human. We are already, inside the skin that makes up the body, a kind of multiple of relations in the world. We're not individual in quite the way that we imagine. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that uh, contemporary science is extremely interested in this relationality, in the complex relationality that makes up humans and makes up communities of all different kinds, particularly at the molecular level. And one of the reasons for this is because the new work that's been going on on food at the molecular level, for example, is about the things that can happen uh, in the complex relationship that's established within the human body. So poor nutrition has an impact on whether you will suffer from uh, certain forms of cancer, particularly uh, hypertension, obesity, and diabetes. 
And in this is the new work on epigenetics. And what's very interesting here about the environment and the way we think about epigenetics now is we no longer think of our bodies as being determined by the genome. We think of our bodies as being growing within complex environments which are not actually bound by the body of the individual human being. So we get inheritable changes in the um, way that the genes are expressed in our body without a change in, in, in the DNA sequence. In other words, we get changes which come about as a result of the way we eat, the way we live, what we do. And in that situation, these uh, boundaries that are established between the inside and the outside move all the time. We take in things, things go out. So we are not, in a sense, bounded from the world, but in a complex relation to it. Now, thinking about how that works, let's just think for a moment about other kinds of living things. So we've talked about glaciers, we've talked about animals, we've talked about our own bodies being in complex relations, but what about trees? So Rabindranath Tragore, the great uh, Bengali uh, poet and sage, said that trees are the Earth's endless effort to speak to the listening heaven. So trees are much older than us. The oldest living tree is probably about 5,000 years old, maybe even more. They outlive humans. They outlive human societies and the manifestation of human societies. They're held to be sacred in almost every part of the world in one way or another. And all of that language which you will be familiar with in the English language is to be found in other languages, those metaphors. So tree of life, tree of knowledge, all of those kinds of things. And trees, funnily enough, are very often involved in all the great myths around the world of how societies come into being. Almost all those myths of whatever kind involve humans in a negotiation with aspects of the natural world, both trees and other animals. And it's that negotiation that brings about the moral framework that starts society. And of course, the one that many of you in this room will be familiar with is Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with a snake. That would be absolutely classic kind of myth of that kind. Oops. Now, the thing is, what have we done with our trees in recent years? Well, this is a picture of the Amazon. The importance of trees to us has just been re-emphasized by COP21 and the UN's statement after that of what forests will mean for the sequestration of carbon for us in the next few years. And yet we're relentlessly cutting them down. The forests themselves are extraordinarily complex environments. They have probably, in the Amazon anyway, about 30,000 species which are epicytes. So they're epicytes, so they're living on other trees. They're made up of very complex <coughs> networks of roots underpinning the forest. And those complexes of roots move nutrients and signal movements and nutrients um, between one living thing and another. Now, the people who inhabit those forests have long had an idea that the forest is connected and that the humans are connected to it. And in a way, it's the modern science that's caught up with the older anthropological ideas of how these things work. People in these forests think of themselves as being in a relation to animals and plants. Excuse me. And this relation goes back to the idea of a social space. <coughs> Sorry. Now, when you're living in a forest like this, you're surrounded not only by plants, but by a large number of animals, some of which are pretty big. Look at the size of that tape here. And the idea is that in these spaces, these animals also have social relations, that they have a perspective on the world, they have a perspective on the forest, and they have a perspective on humans. And that what humans need to do to understand these animals is to recognize what that perspective is about. So in the forest world, it's all really about understanding that although you, the human, may be seeing blood, the peccary over there may be seeing um, beer. <coughs> Sorry, it's not good, is it, this coughing? Um, and in that, in that situation, the animals, as they move about, have a view of you, just as you have a view of them. And it's important to understand that view clearly. Now, <coughs> when we are thinking about other people's views of animals, it's very often said to me, oh, yes, but this is really just about a belief that these people have. 
not a real understanding of the connection between things. It's just a kind of cultural idea. Well, Edward Lear did this wonderful set of drawings where he anthropomorphized them. In other words, he, he gave plants a kind of human aspect to them. And the criticism that's often made of a lot of anthropology is that it's not really important how other people think about living forests and the connections between them, because it's just a question of, of a set of beliefs which are not being bo borne out by science itself. So it is a kind of upsy downy version of the world which you don't really need to pay attention to. Well, let's take a different view about that. Let's think about how flowers communicate with bees. So one of the things we know about these systems of communication is that they are extraordinarily complex, and we do not understand how many of them work. We know that it's got something to do with color, something to do with shapes and patterns, something to do with smell, but it's also got something to do with electric, electromagnetic fields. The complexity of this kind of communication is extraordinary. And one of the things about plants is that plants are, because they don't move very much, a kind of part of the natural world which we have come to think of as rather beautiful, but not necessarily particularly sentient or sensate. Now, the question is, what's the latest science on this? Well, one of the things that's very, very interesting is how do we make sense of what plants do? So take, for example, a plant like the Patagonian vine, which exists in these South American rainforests that I've been talking to you about. This is a plant that grows on other trees. And as it grows, it changes its leaf shape to mimic all the trees that it grows across. And we have no idea how it does this. So it's not, in, it's not like a plant. There are plenty of plants in the world that mimic. So there are plants in deserts that look like stones, for example. And we can imagine a straightforward theory of how that would work. A plant is evolved in a particular environment. It is, uh, makes itself look like a stone, and therefore it's not subject to predators. But actually, the Patagonian vine is a bit cleverer than that. It actually mimics different kinds of species as it moves across them. Now, how does it do that? We're not, we're not in sure, but we do know that plants don't have brains. We know that they don't have thought, so they can't have intentionality, and they certainly don't have language. But think about another kind of, of um, uh, vine that exists in those, in those forests. And this is a vine which produces its its, its own toxic defense, except that there is an insect called the zebra longwing, which has uh, become immune to those toxins. It actually um, uses those toxins to produce new toxins of its own, which then make it toxic to birds, which would eat it. Now, the vine that it lives on responds to this problem of being eaten by the zebra longwing by producing eggs or, or little yellow pustules along its leaf, which look just like the eggs of the zebra longwing. And that means that when the zebra longwing comes along to lay its eggs on the vine, it already looks like somebody's already taken that space, already laid its eggs there. So there's no purpose in doing that anymore. So there's a complex system of communication between these, between these um, insects and plants in this space. And we don't really know how that process of communication works. And it's that you can see it happening in, in actually in live and real time. But we've got used to thinking of plants as just things that we eat and that they're not particularly interested in them as being sensate or living. Well, take this then. This is Mimosa pudica. So many of you will know this plant. It's a plant that we always used to play around with as children. So you touch it and the leaves curl up. The idea is that the leaves always the original idea was that the leaves curl because what you're <clears throat> the plant is worried about is threat. So it's withdrawing from threat, and somehow it's a protective uh, task. Well, there's a new branch of science now called the neurobiology of plants, and they've been doing tests on Mimosa pudica. And what they do is they take Mimosa pudica and they drop it several times. And each time they drop it to start with, the leaves close. They keep on doing it and the leaves stop closing. The plant seems to learn that this particular activity is not really a proper threat to it, so it doesn't do it. So then they waited a week, and they did the test again, and dropped it in the same way, and the plant didn't close. 
So they thought, oh, maybe we've damaged the plant by dropping it. That'd be sensible, wouldn't it? And so they touched it with their finger and the leaf closed. They went back a month later and dropped it to see whether the leaf would close. It didn't. So Mimosa pudica is somehow learning that certain kinds of threats are really not important. Some are and some aren't. And it's doing it in real time. So how is this plant doing this? It doesn't have a brain. It can't possibly be doing it in any way which we normally think of as thinking or interacting with others. But it is interacting, living in a vital way with its environment. Now, when we come to think about the relationality of the world and different aspects of the world and how we think about that relationality, of course, one of the extraordinary things about humans is that we are already making great strides in changing that natural world. We are already designing and, and constructing new biological entities that have never existed. This one is one that's beloved of people who are very much against genetic modification, and it's all about putting um, fish cells into strawberries so that they last longer in your fridge. So next time you have strawberries, uh, do think about whether you're actually eating fish. The, the, the issue here, though, is that synthetic biology, the ability to create new living systems, is well within our grasp. So we're not only um, enmeshed in a world which is a set of complex relationalities that have suddenly become, we've become aware of with new science, and those complex relationalities look in some senses quite like some older ideas that people used to have of how plants and animals and landscapes relate to each other. Now you might say, well, you know, what are the, the limits of, of this kind of thing? Well, I just draw your attention to the fact that we're now in a situation where not only can we create new living entities in the world, but we can also attach them to our information technology systems. And we, using our information technology systems, we can reanimate things which we have thought of as being inanimate objects. So we, in the modern science that we're engaged in, are already changing the boundary between what is animate and what is inanimate. So some of you may know, and it's a an example that um, I've thought a lot about in terms of what's come to be called the Internet of Things is that very soon it will not be necessary for you to carry your mobile phone. You'll be able to tap the desktop here and it'll be your phone. Samsung has just launched a new fridge which takes selfies of the inside of the fridge and sends them to you on your mobile phone when you're at work saying, look, no milk. <coughs> Please buy on the way home. Right? So the world around us is changing remarkably. And in that relationality, our modern science is in that relational space. It's in that complex relationality. And in that space of molecular exchange, complex, interdependent, non-linear molecular systems that the world is, 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 is made up of, we humans have a particular role to play. Now, <clears throat> I just want to end with this thought. And this is a thought about Ecuador and Bolivia. Again, when people talk about how do we think about the world and how do we imagine it? What kind of theory do we need to have about the world in order to tackle the big issues around climate change? In um, Ecuador and in Bolivia, there are strongly held views about the fact that ancient landscapes are sentient. Like the glaciers, they have views. The mountains are sentient, they're sacred. So the forests are other aspects of the natural world. And what's happened in these places is that in both countries, they have incorporated the rights of Mother Nature and of these sentient landscapes and complex worlds and the human relation to them into the Constitution. So in the Constitution of Ecuador at this time, Mother Nature has rights not only for the protection of <coughs> her, um, her status and her well-being, but she also has rights to reparation, the things that you might do wrong. So this is a particularly different kind of world from the world that we normally imagine. When we think of legal entities being about uh, relating only to persons or to societies or to, or to entities that can be created as legal persons. So that would be things like companies and so on. But in this kind of way of thinking, if you expand your relational view of the world, if you, in, if you enhance it in this way, then you have to change your legal framework. You actually have to change the nature of politics. You actually have to say that in the political realm, these sentient beings 
So the great forests of the world, the, the great uh, <coughs> the, the plant life that's in them, the animals, all of the Earth's biosystems actually have rights. They have rights just like you have rights, and you're part of that complex um, system. So for about 300 years, really, from the middle of the 17th century up until the middle of the last century, I think, so from Boyle's pump uh, to Hiroshima, roughly, we really thought that we were, we were masters of our own fate. I think the mess that we've got ourselves into following Hiroshima and all that's happened up to this last moment with COP21 last year has taught us that we are not uh, masters of our own fate. We're part of a set of very complex physical material relations in the world. We're not the only sentient beings in that world. We don't understand the nature of those other beings entirely. We don't even understand the nature of how they communicate with each other. But we have learned how to create new biological entities, and we have learned how to connect those new biological entities to the information technologies that we use to communicate with each other. So we're changing that world dramatically. And I think all we have to hope for is that we are going to change it for the better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Henrietta. Well timed, and there's time now for, for any questions. On the, the one at the back there. Uh, how does the glacier um, express its dislike of frying bacon? <laughs> well, the, the, uh, <clears throat> what is said to be the great risk of frying bacon is that you will cause a surge, that the glacier will, will move on you. Um, and these, these surges have been uh, experienced historically, and they're very well attested to, both, of course, in... Uh, in um, North America, <clears throat> the boundary between America and, and Canada, but, but also in, in Europe during what was known as the, as the Little Ice Age. So from the sort of middle of the 16th century up until the middle of the 19th century, Europe was much colder. And at that moment, um, when the, the glaciers surged in France, for example, they devastated whole villages to the, and, and people's lands. And so frightened were people that they would run into the ice caves on the way, on, in the front of the glacier, brandishing their swords, trying to get the glacier to go back, and calling on the archbishop to come and bless the glacier and say, you know, you really must desist. You must move no more. Yeah. One down here. Yes. <coughs> now, can you hang on for the mic? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is it possible to have prosperity without economic growth? Mm. Well, um, that's a question I'm asked sort of almost every day of the week. And uh, the answer is yes, I think it is. Um, but I think you can't have zero economic growth. And I don't think we're going to be in that situation because there are going to be new developments in technology, some of which I was alluding to here. But the, the main difficulty is that the kind of economic <clears throat> growth that we have had has also caused a great deal of social inequality. Social inequality itself impedes growth. Um, the kind of growth we've had has also depended on the use of fossil fuels. And the way in which we've managed the use of fossil fuels, along with other things like consumption patterns and our aspirations for living and so on, have resulted in this kind of consumption of the planet that we're now involved in. Uh, and the, the issue, I think, is that we are in a situation of extreme um, financial instability and volatility, as we've seen at the beginning of this year. That is going to continue. And that kind of volatility and instability has an impact on growth. So we see weakening growth. Uh, if we go back two years, all the growth that the, um, that the G20 were projecting was to, going to come from the emerging markets. So the emerging markets, so, you know, Russia is in a terrible state, Brazil is in a terrible state, China is slowing. There isn't growth. Uh, Madame Lagarde has just down, downgraded the growth prediction for, for this year. So we're going to have to learn to live in a situation of low growth and enhanced prosperity. Um, and that's really one of my jobs as the director of the Institute for Global Prosperity, is to work out how we're going to do that. If you've got a mic, yes. 
Um, I wasn't thinking of growth being a good thing per se, because I was thinking of it as being um, apparently usually destructive. Yes, and I mean, it is, it is, it is this in, it, in the last 40 years, the human capital across the globe has gone up. We've taken a billion people out of poverty with growth. The difficulty we've got now is that we're at possibly at the end of that growth cycle. So the situation is that uh, with the climate change we're currently experiencing, we're at risk of, of sending 100 million people back into poverty. Because although climate change is global, its effects are local. And therefore, we need to look much more closely than we, than we have to how people will manage these complex uh, environments like the Amazonian rainforest, like the grassland, dry grasslands of Africa, all of these kinds of spaces, how they will manage those spaces under pressure and really, and really at, attend to those issues of, of the, the responsibility we have for making sure that that works. And there's one uh, over here. Oh, that's right there. Um, so, uh, you were talking about adding the environment, the natural environment, to the legal system. Um, if someone was to, say, cut down a bit of rainforest or whatever, how would they then um, re like repay that kind of thing? What, what is the what is the punishment? What's the um, yeah. you know, to, uh, and are there examples of, of societies where people you know? do you actually repay to the environment rather than to a person or a government or something? Yes, there are. I mean, obviously, the, 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 certainly uh, one of the features of environmental management in many societies around the world has been a, a, a relation of ritualized respect. So you would have sacrifice or you would have other ways of paying back for, or, or for saying sorry for infractions of various kinds. I mean, when you're talking about the constitution of Bolivia, uh, Bolivia and Ecuador, um, you know, then this is, this is more about um, the superstructure of managing <coughs> uh, en entities that are involved in, say, mining or, you know, cutting down forests and so on and the penalties for that. Uh, but the, there's no, I don't know whether there's actually been a case yet. This happened in 2008, but I don't know that there's actually been a case, an actually legal case yet for reparation for the Pachamama, but it would be very interesting to know. And now you've raised it, I'm going to go and look. Thank you very much. There's one down here. Um, so you presented a pretty optimistic view about how the sort of increasing relationality that we're going to get through technological developments like the selfie-taking fridge um, might sort of create a, a, a different kind of relationship that we have to our environment that is more relational. But surely in in the kind of technology you're talking about, that the, those, um, those technologies are all aiming to give us a better sense of, of being masters of our own fate, of having like total control yeah. over our environment. So is it not the case that maybe, I'm also thinking of like an analogy with pets, like the way that we think of our pet, you know, as those images show, the way we think of our pets is very much a sort of imagining a certain kind of consciousness yeah. such that we can control it and we're like, oh, they love me, they love their life, or whatever it is. Mm. Maybe that's a bit cynical, but I worry that that is the case. No, I think that's, I think that's, a, very, I think that's a very good point, and I think that's what, one of the things I was trying to get across, is that, that the, uh, we have to think again about what our relations are with, 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 with plants and animals and the planet and everything, even, and even the mountains. And often when you say that to people, they say, oh, you know, you must be one of those sandal-wearing, muesli-eating people who are basically vote for the Green Party, and basically you're a crackpot, okay? I mean, that's the answer. You're just not, you're mad, okay? What I was trying to do by coming at this from a different angle was to point out to you that this, the, 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 these ideas about complex relationality are underpinning large areas of, this, of, of, of new developments in science. I mean, this is, the, we're changing, the science in a way, is changing faster people's accept the, the acceptability for many people around the world of these ideas than, um, than anthropology has ever been able to do. I mean, as an anthropologist, we've had for decades and decades, you know, voluminous tomes talking about how people relate to the natural world. And mostly, much of that is discounted because people just say, well, this is just about their cultural belief. 
it's not real. You don't need to worry about those relationalities. And what I'm trying to point out to you is actually there, there, are, there, there are new areas of knowledge emerging which are about complex relationality, much of it at the molecular level. And that's extremely interesting because it's changing the way we think about life, about what vitality is, and about how uh, all aspects of life, because, li because the, but the, at the molecular level, there are these boundaries that we imagine are not respected. These are complex self-organizing systems. And so, actually, at the molecular level, everything we do is a multi-species engagement, just that we don't think of it like that. We carry on thinking about Fido as being responding to something that we imagine as a way of being intelligent or organizing or responsive. A very limiting way of it. Yes, this one here. Thank you. Uh, could you expand on your thoughts about the interaction between the um, gastrointestinal microbiome and the humans mm. in terms of physiological effects or, or, or psychological effects mm. and with some examples? Mm -hmm. Well, there's been um, quite a lot of uh, research done on the impact of certain kinds of so-called Western diets on the, on the, gut, on the gut, on the floor of, of the gut. Um, so that, the, um, and we've had, there's been work that's done that's compared the sort of, you know, the gut bacteria for, of people in the developed Europe, Western world with people in different parts of the, the globe, you know, many of whom live in smaller communities. Um, and in general, they have more, those people who live in smaller communities, they have more diverse gut bacteria. And the latest research on gut bacteria is that not only all these little green bugs, if you like, living inside us, but they do have not only an impact on um, our, uh, our health, not just our gastro and, and gastrointestinal health, but other aspects of our health, but a strong impact on mood and our mental health. And I mean, this, this, this research is it's new and it's extremely contested, as you can imagine. You know, one part of the profession is saying one thing, another part of the profession is saying another. That's quite common as new science emerges. It's not as though it's a, 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 done, a done deal. But certainly, um, there's a lot more emphasis on the fact that we have to understand that the, that, that the body's complex relation to other, other, other communities, essentially, that are living inside the body is important for its well-being. Any more questions? No. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Henrietta. You've managed to show us, uh, in, a, in a tidy space of time, how full <laughs> the whole subject is, how enriching it is. Um, and uh, the questions have uh, amplified that. And thank you very much for the questions. So, perhaps you could join with me in thanking Henrietta Moore very much indeed. And interesting. <laughs>